Taming Lightning podcast is supported by the Pittsburgh Glass Center, a nonprofit public access glass studio and one of the top glass facilities of its kind in the U.S., with a knowledgeable and friendly staff and a safe, fun atmosphere. Our community is made up of artists, collectors, college students, or just those fascinated by glass. Depending on your interest and schedule, there's a class for you, be it a two-hour introductory workshop, eight-week classes, or a five-day summer intensive taught by artists from all over the world. This spring, starting in March, I'll be teaching a two-night hands-on workshop for creating plasma globes. On the first night, you'll be working with me to create your globe, adding color, pushing and pulling the glass. On the second night, you'll see your piece filled with neon gases and light up before your eyes. This class does not require any glass experience and mostly geared toward those local to Pittsburgh. For those with more glass experience, you may want to consider taking this summer's five-day intensive called Light Up Your World with Plasma, taught by Wayne Stradman and Mundy Hepburn. This class will be located in the Flame Studio and is running from August 6th through August 10th. Explore the dynamic world of plasma with instructors Wayne Stradman and Mundy Hepburn, who have passionately delved in this medium for the last 35 years. This class is designed to provide an understanding of soft and hard glass techniques for making a vacuum envelope mixing of noble gases, and electrical considerations pertaining to different arc patterns. We also study high voltage power supplies and how to safely use them. Everyone will have a chance to design and complete their own plasma light with guidance from the instructors. As of this episode, three have already signed up taking advantage of the early bird rate. This discount lasts until February 1st and will rise to full rate on April 15th. If you know you would like to take this class, take advantage of the early bird registration price. For more information, please check us out on the web at www.pittsburghglasscenter.org or call our studio at 412-365-2145. Welcome back, or welcome to the Tammy Lightning Podcast. I'm Percy Eccles II. I'm the creator and host of Tammy Lightning, as well as the emerging neon lab tech at Pittsburgh Glass Center, where I'm researching and developing a space for exploring plasma and neon light. Tammy Lightning is an educational blog and podcast about the art, science, and history of plasma and neon light, looking beyond its associations for novelty and sign making and to explore the potential of rare or noble gases by learning about those that use them. We'll be talking with artists, makers, and researchers, each guest offering their unique knowledge and experience. The intro is boosted by Joachim Karud. Joachim is a Swedish artist who loves to produce chill and happy music, and does so for copyright-free use. Be sure to support his music by giving credit when used, subscribing, and or by donation on Patreon. You can find them on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify. In today's podcast, we'll be talking with Dylan Newworth, an artist and sculptor working in light, space, and interactive technologies, which includes neon and virtual reality. His work is autobiographical, with light being embedded in his personal narrative, a custom-made neon sign with his mother's name and red cursive letter, Blade Runner, and David Bowie's Space Oddity are a part of his origin. Like many artists, light is a beacon, a place to return to, or something to reveal the darkness we cannot bear to look at. His work expands on themes that may include early memories of alienation, subconscious violence, and systematic addiction through the use of digital cultural motifs. Dylan is the creative director at Western Neon and Western Neon School of Art, which just opened this year, offering classes to the public, offering the process of neon for artists, hobbyists, and students. Dylan will talk about his role at Western Neon, challenges that come with Neon, and classes and the future of Western Neon School of Art. Dylan and I were introduced to Danny Kays, who is a Neon apprentice at Western Neon. Though we officially connected through Instagram, we have briefly crossed paths while she was staff and I was a student during a summer workshop at Pilcha Glass School, the origin of my interest in plasma and Neon. 
So I'd like to thank Dania for connecting us, and perhaps we'll have her on a future podcast. Here we have with us today is uh, Dylan Newworth. Am I saying your last name correctly? That is correct, sir. And uh, so before we begin, can you tell us a little about yourself and uh, what do you do? Yeah, I'm a, um, an artist who works with uh, light, space, and interactive technologies. And, um, I am from Athens, Georgia originally, and <clears throat> have lived in the Pacific Northwest since about 2000. And my work is um, essentially autobiographical in nature, and I work with uh, noble gases such as helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon, and as well as digital um, mediums like virtual reality and uh, online interactive uh, experiences to um, figure out what this world is all about and, and, and who I am and, and, and my place in it. And uh, hopefully my work speaks to other people as well. Uh, I also um, have most recently become the creative director at Western Neon, which is uh, one, one of the West Coast uh, the premier custom sign builders as well as uh, uh, it creates custom artwork for artists working on public pieces or um, small scale components for their uh, for their work. And uh, I've been working with Western Neon for over 15 years as an artist myself, uh, fabricating my work um, alongside them and uh, a core team of, of, of people I work with to execute uh, my work, and whether it's public art or or, or for exhibitions and um, most recently, we established Western Neon School of Art, uh, which is a nonprofit educational institution that uh, supports uh, our our collective interest in light and space and uh, interactive technologies. Cool. So, so what is it that um, what do you do as a creative director? Um, well, it's 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 kind of many things. Uh, to, to be honest, uh, one, one, one of the main things that we wanted to focus on was that uh, Western Neon was established by um, two brothers, uh, Michael and Jay Blazik, in the, in, in the early 80s in Seattle. And the purpose of, of that was they wanted to start a, um, a gallery to display light work, and to display work in neon, and, and to display uh, uh, people who are interested in all the different avenues that go with them go with that medium called neon because I mean, it's called neon, but it, there, there's just so much more to it. Uh, whether artists are working in um, explorations and investigations and are working with plasma and blown glass or um, using different noble gases to make work that um, essentially is all about light. So uh, we understand that blanket term neon is to include all the different ways in which artists have used the, basic technologies of the medium to um, to make their work. So what we wanted to do was kind of, um, well, as Western Neon started as a gallery, it eventually morphed into a sign company because the Blazics um, needed to generate um, cash. So um, that idea, though, of Western Neon being built around art has always been in the DNA. Um, so I was with the Chihuly Studio, for 10 years as a project manager and uh, essentially my job was to um, literally travel the world and uh, assess sites that would be viable for Mr. Chihuly's work and work with uh, designers and architects and engineers uh, and artists within the studio to realize large-scale works. Um, so we sort of saw an opportunity to take Western Neon's um, ethos, the core idea about art, and um, invigorate, reinvigorate uh, the business and kind of combine all those pursuits. Um, so for us, we really wanted to you know, stretch out our, our uh, um, all the different assets that we had and all the different talents that we had amassed over the years and that Andre, the owner, had put together to realize new opportunities for the business. So um, sometimes I'm visiting with architecture firms and design firms to educate them on um, what the possibilities are for working with the medium from um, architectural or design-based approaches or just to sort of um, show them the power of the medium because I think if you've been in this medium for a long time, it's, there's just cycles in it where it's 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 popular and it's it's it's, it's everywhere and it kind of goes away for a little while and it comes back. But 
I think in the last five years, the surge in the popularity of the medium has gotten out of control. Uh, it's it's amazing. It's 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 kind of people looking back to the nostalgia of you know the early '80s as well as embracing the future. And I think that neon's always pointed to both those directions. So you know, some days it's 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 uh it's being a, an evangelist for the medium at at, at, at different entities. Uh, some days it's uh, designing uh, copy and content for um, upcoming things that might land on social media. Some days it's uh, visiting a, a job site and making sure that all, you know, the aesthetics of what we're doing are, are, are on point. Um, some days it's uh, ripping out drop ceilings and, and, and bad 80s carpet to uh, establish uh, a, potentially a, a, a virtual reality area where we can set up an Oculus Rift. Uh, and a Google Tilt Brush program um, at Western Neon so we can better envision a project. Um, mm. you know, some days it's literally sweeping a parking lot because we've got some clients coming and I want to make sure that we look um, we look tidy. You know, so it's it's a lot of different hats uh, that eventually all pointed towards um, one of the main goals, which is establishing the school. Nice. Um, what do you see uh, in Neon that's that could potentially be a problem for its ability to stay um, in the scene. I think the school that you're starting up and many others have maintained that environment is one of the key ways to to keep it present. No, I know. I mean, I, I, I kind of know what you're pointing at. I mean, I think, I, I, I think with, um, well, it's, it's, it's a lot of things. I mean, you, you're sort of uh, pointing toward a lot of things. The, I think one of the main things about Neon um, is that it is, in essence, uh, as far as I'm concerned, one of the original, if not the original, digital medium. I mean, it's a it, 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 the technology that is used to express work in the medium really hasn't changed since you know, 1898. You know, uh, the the infrastructure to make it more efficient might have changed, but the way in which glass tubes are um, produced, the way in which glass tubes are shaped, um, or glass volumes if they're blown glass, and that gas is put into that volume under in, in a vacuum and electrified, that hasn't changed that much. But I think that what's exciting about that is, is that that idea of putting gas in a glass volume and under a vacuum and electrifying it, you know, that that technology gave rise to the vacuum tube and the cathode tube. And the vacuum tube was the first way that we uh, stored memory on a computer uh, in the 50s by lining up electrons on either side of the tube uh, in a pattern of ones and zeros. It led to the cathode tube, which was the first way that illuminated the screen uh, for us to view data. Um, the, the experiments that um, we're, we're taking place in the early 1900s to fire particles at photographic plates and looking at their divergence that eventually morphed into the particle accelerator. I mean, it kind of sets this sort of digital ecosystem up, which um, for me, seeing a, 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 an illuminated tube at the beginning and seeing virtual reality at the other side, I mean, they're both still telling the narrative of light. They're sort of working in that same way. Um, so I think that what you see there is this connection between what we consider this analog medium, but that it's still very digital. And I think that there's, you know, there's been many think pieces. There's been, been, been much um, conversation, especially in the last five years about how do you, how do you sustain that work? Or what, what, what is the archival process for preserving works in that medium? Because, you know, whether we like it or not, the art world is still completely dominated by traditional mediums. Painting and and pa painting will always be at the top of that paradigm. And sculpture is, you know, behind that. So I think that the collectability of the medium is, is I think, one challenge. I think that it's uh, a, a challenge to give people not only the ability to understand the skills and the um, crazy expansive knowledge that I think you have to put together to make work in this medium. It's not just taking an idea and making it a form out of it. It's knowing electricity. It's knowing um, architecture and engineering to kind of put, how do you put that stuff somewhere? How do you, you know, how do you do all that stuff? So I think 
you know, it's the challenge of it being archival. It's how do you show the work? How do you transport the work um, from like an art making level? But then as you were kind of mentioning on a school level, it's like, how do you uh, provide a place where people can learn skills to work in the medium? But how do you extrapolate that? How do you build on that? How do you um, not only give someone a chance to come in and take a, a tube bending class, but, but to say, how, and how do you make art out of that? What do you do after that? Like you've made that tube and you've made that, you know, the, perhaps that phrase or those series of shapes. What do you do after that? And then how do you build bodies of work that keep coming after that? So I think, you know, to kind of pull it all together for us, we're, we're, we're trying to start a school that is not just a series of classes that offer a set of skills, um, although that's one of our primary um, focuses, but how do you build on that to understand the history of the medium? How do you expand that history of the medium? And then how do you include all the different um, diverse voices that are doing work within it that have never had a chance uh, to have their voice heard? Yeah, it seems like the <clears throat> it seems like the common thread here is that the art is the only, is uh, one way to connect both the ability to the technical aspect, but also um, what do you call it sustaining the practice relevant to today. Um, and it's, yeah. I think it's one yeah. of the few things that um, people ignore when most people hear the word art and and their references towards that, and it really points to uh, education as being really needing to be looked at. Oh, I completely agree with you. I mean, um, you know, two things that I think about is, you know, number one, that, um, you know, there's this fear that all these, you know, you, know, you course through Twitter, you scan through, you know, whatever you're scrolling through. And it, it's, you know, it's this idea that, you know, by, by 2030, th this many jobs will be gone to automated, automated, you know, computer controlled job, you know, that, you know, computers are going to come steal your job. I mean, that's, kind of like that scary dystopian future, but it's also on some level kind of true that there's so many different things that I think humans perform as a function that will be replaced simply because the person in control of the financing chooses a quote unquote more efficient way to do it. But the one thing that I don't think will ever be replaced is the idea of creativity. Mm -hmm. A person having the ability, you know, to make something from nothing, um, and that how do you give people, empower people to have the ability to um, express that creativity and be and, and be paid for it and to advocate that the fact that creativity has value and to try to set it up where, I mean, look, I mean, my goal and having done work in this medium for so long and having worked um, in conjunction with tech companies um, a number of times <clears throat> on commissions or, or, um, or, or, or working with entities where you have to advocate for the value of the artist and advocate for the value of the skills and, 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 and for the technique. So if we can use the building blocks of the medium to teach people how to use their creativity to also be, be gainfully employed by that, you know, that's that base building block. And then to extrapolate that into saying, well, there's that building block that you can do that, but then also how do you twist that into also being more adept at design? or about understanding how to how to work with an entity like a tech company who wants to do a commission with you that for light based work or interactive work, but you understand how to make a contract. You understand how to work with that tech company or that or that corporation or that um, whomever is doing the commissioning that it's also teaching uh, uh, how to value your creativity so much that you are also operating um, intelligently on on a business level you know i would love to uh to all my experiences and in, in the art world from all these many different areas can we can we also ab advocate for that and teach that too you know so i think that would also in a way um instill that idea that you can be creative you can make your work but you don't have to starve to do it and you don't have to stretch yourself so thin just because you have a gift you shouldn't have to suffer because you have a gift and you shouldn't be um, constantly having to fight for the, you know, there's a power in that and you should never have to defend it, which I think that a lot of artists on, in, 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 in all mediums end up having to deal with, um, I think, consistently. So how can we, 
how can we both educate as well as advocate? You know, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Because you know, I mean, you, you know, you you yourself are um, in, in, invested in a, um, a part of the medium which is um, exploding right now as well. I mean, you know, I mean, your plasma work is definitely an area in which people are investing a lot of interest right now, and it's 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 definitely. I mean, it's not like you wake up every day and go like, oh, I'll go be an ER artist. Oh, I'll go work with plasma. I mean, right? You know, you kind of yeah. You kind of sort of fall into that, and um, that infrastructure is difficult to establish, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I personally kind of just fell into it just by taking a class at Pilchuck, and from there has been connecting and meeting uh, various people, including yourself, whether it's bit by social media or a friend of a friend or, hey, check this person out type of thing. So um, it, Bruce recently called me, Bruce Suber recently called me and said, uh, kind of gave me some tips on uh, what to do next. And one of the biggest things is just uh, keep working at it and don't stop because, you know, he himself and, and yourself, you, you got this long road and, and then you got to where you are now and that took, you know, uh, unyielding effort, as I like to say. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's a that's a beautiful way to put it because, uh, you know, I mean, that's what it takes. And, and, um, and you know, and, and it's weird because sometimes, you know, you'll be on social media and you'll be doing stuff and um, maybe conversing with somebody. And, and, and it's weird because for some reason this phrase always, uh, it's so true, but it always for some reason gets me when someone's like, um, you know, keep going, keep doing what you're doing. And it's just like, man, well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing, but it's like you you hear that, and at the same time, you in some ways it can be bristling because to keep doing what you're doing and to have the unyielding um, drive, you know, you will find yourself constantly through life grinding up against so many different things because to maintain that sense of you know passion and drive, it it uh, it, it it can be all consuming, um, mm-hmm. which I think it needs to be. Uh, for you to get where you're going. And I think what's insane about that and what's also beautiful is that if you have that drive and that passion, which you have, uh, you know, Percy and um, all the different people who are doing so many killer things, you all, you you also always don't know where you're going, which mm-hmm. can be insane. Right. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you keep driving, you keep grinding, but it's like someone could be like, well, what do you, you know, like somebody who's kind of on the on, on the peripheral, they're like, well, what are you, what's your goal in three years? And it's like, well, hey, I know, but I don't exactly know. Mm-hmm. You know, and that can be crazy to people because they're just like, well, because, you know, most people live on these sort of tracked lives. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I'm going to work three years, I'm going to get this, and then I'm going to go, uh, and then I can apply for this job, and then I can, I can buy the house, and then we'll have a vacation in three years, and we're going to have two kids in five years. And you're just like, what are you talking about, man? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's yeah. just not how we live our lives. Um, but you're, I think at the same time, infinitely more driven. And I think you have to be mm-hmm. that's the only way to do it. Yeah. There's a little bit of freedom when it comes to, as well as the, the overall makes sense of fear when you have kind of this open plane to the open timeline, but it, mm-hmm. it's not just open the whole time. Once you take a step in one direction, you'll find there's a question. And if you look at that question long enough, you'll find a different way to go. Maybe that question is more important oh, yeah. to you and you'll you go that direction, but you're still going forward the entire time. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think you're exactly right. I mean, it, it's kind of like, yeah, there's a map there, but not all the details are filled in, mm-hmm. you know? And I think, that, you know, that's, that to me, that's, I mean, it's like, you know, Jorge Luis Borges and the, and the kind of math that's not filled in yet. And the, the idea that, uh, you know, m- maybe the map's full of mirrors, you know, so you, <laughs> you can, can kind of see yourself or see where you're going, but it's also full of reflection. So it's not all mm-hmm. exactly quote unquote real. I mean, you know, like what, well, you know, it kind of reminds me of is that I think that people have, um, obviously the public has a certain perception of Mr. Chihuly and is, is, and I think that, what you know what he's done in the art world um since he was been so prolific since the early 70s but what's cool about knowing him a little bit behind the scenes is to have seen his date books from like the 80s like his calendar and his date books and and you know these these things are just like 
maybe they started off like one inch thick, but they're like five inches thick because they're just stuffed with business cards and notes and like, you know, you can just sort of see this guy hustling through the eighties when he's kind of building his career, at, you know, basically in his middle of his life when, you know, as an artist, I think when you, you I mean, you know, I kind of feel like you hit your stride in your, in, in, in your late thirties, early forties, you know, where you really know what you've done, you know what you're good at. If you put that 5,000 hours into whatever you're doing and you kind of, you kind of do it. And it's kind of mm-hmm. cool to see that, like, even talking to him, he's just like, yeah, I didn't really know what I was exactly doing, but I was doing it. You know, you know, it's, it, it's inspiring. Yeah. Speaking of Chihuly, there were some, uh, you know, of course, there's always an air of, uh, I usually call it, I can't even think of the word right now, but I guess in general, when it came, comes to Dale Chihuly, most people um, kind of scoff at his, uh, at his fame a little bit, uh, mainly by the process in which he uh, has his work made. And, um, right. it, it, and I'll admit, initially, I was uh, like that until, you know, a couple of years into glass blowing, where I was like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because, uh, if you look at glass and, and you're working in a, a group, in a setting where you need multiple people to help you get stuff done, because it takes multiple hands and, and people with special skills, and then it doesn't matter because the ability to come together, uh, despite perhaps some personality bumping, uh, is what really is, it's all about when you can come together and collaborate. Everyone has a oh, job I mean, and you take pride. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, that's, 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 that's literally kind of, that's kind of where I'm at now these days is that like, um, you know, it's not exactly about, I mean, the project's always important. Like what's going on with what's going on with the work, but what's more important is the people. I, I just, I really want to work on, you know, projects where it's about the people who's involved, who's working on this. Are we going to have a chance to hang out? Like, you can do anything. Anything is possible, but it's only, it's only made that way because of the people you're working with. And so I think mm-hmm. if you're especially looking to do things, you know, in this medium, I think as we all know, anyone involved in working with um, technology on mm-hmm. any level and neon and, 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 and all the things that are associated with it, it's definitely a technology. In fact, like I, I think like I've, I've mentioned before, one of the, I feel like one of the original technologically based bodies of work, I mean, you know, ceramics is not that different. It's the same mm-hmm. thing. You need that kind of infrastructure of a place and a kiln and, and, and what it takes to make that work. It's not that much different than making glass or something in this medium, but you need those people and you need that kind of sense of teamwork to make something bigger than what you were thinking, as well as I think if you go in there with the idea for something, you may not come out of that studio with that idea. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it might mm-hmm. fail, especially yeah. when you're making work in, in glass. It doesn't always behave what the way you want it to. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just, yep. it just doesn't. So I think that's, that's also a pretty cool thing. Uh, so let's take a turn back to the school, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, of course. So as you're starting out uh, with the classes, what's the format like and what are the classes uh, kind of geared up? at the moment? Well, um, we our, our our first, our first offering is, um, opening on January 23rd and it's <clears throat> introduction to light based media. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what the, what the class essentially is, it's taught by, um, Kelsey Fernkopf, who is, uh, a, a technician and, um, uh, essentially one of the, a master glass bender. Um, he's been in, been in the medium for 30 plus years. And, uh, he, he has a, he has a, a, a touch with the glass. Like it uh, is, is very rare. Um, you know, he is one of those guys that can have the blow hose in his mouth and, and, and be bending and talking and hanging out at the same time. And the next thing you know, there's this piece, you know, that's just, that's just, and he's, he's very generous with his energy and time. So, um, he uh he learned from Fred Elliott, um, who was his mentor, and um also Fred Elliott studied with Dean Blazik, who is the father of the two 
sons, Michael and Jay, who started Western Neon. So Kelsey's legacy in the medium is goes very deep. And so he is teaching the skills uh, for our first class. And I will be also co-teaching with him to um, talk more about the history and more about the um, conceptual approach to working with the medium. Um, so literally, you got like a six-week class. and um, it, it, it covers, uh, you know, the, the curriculums focused on um, each class goes into a history or theory part of the medium. And then the rest of the class is focused on skills. And um, we were uh, uh, happy to see on uh, Friday, actually yesterday, that um, we got um, five of the of the original uh, fires that were at the um, at, at Dean's school in the 70s. Um, Exciting from Wisconsin, yeah. So we kind of had these legacy fires that taught over, I believe, 700 neon vendors from around the world, um, from the 70s to the 80s, and now we have them at Western Neon. So um, that first class literally focuses on that. Just here are the basic building blocks of this medium, and um, you get some open studio times on Saturdays in between. And um, our hope is to build off this. Uh, to, you know, literally offer this to if you're just a you know a novice who's just like, hey, I want to check out the medium. Um, you're a working artist who wants to incorporate this into your practice, or you're someone who's worked with it for many years and you don't have access to a facility. You know, this is what we're this is for you. So that's kind nice. of the focus. Is it like a, a one one day a week type of course? Yeah, it's um it's on. Uh, this, this first class is on Tuesdays uh, from 6 to 9 p.m. And then, and that's for six weeks. And then you've got uh, the four open studio Saturdays to come in and, and practice and work more independently uh, mm -hmm. with a technician available. Uh, do you guys uh, have a, a focus for a, uh, your, your prime, you have a primary audience? Are you reaching out to the colleges or uh, how, how young are, are you looking to jump in there? Is it like a high school type of thing that you may be doing in the future? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, we, we, we kind of, um, it, I'll say that we are very, um, we are very focused and directed on what we're doing in the future, as well as it's all happening very fast. We, we got together this summer and, um, the stars kind of aligned for, um, me to be, uh, you know, available and, uh, had, had, had left the Chihuly studio to focus on some personal projects. And then um, Kelsey was was back from a, a number of travels and, and Andre at Western Neon was like, hey, I think it's time we do this. So the class got going so fast that we filled up the first class uh, literally 48 hours after we posted it. Um, most of some people over the years who had expressed interest in taking a class or um, Kelsey had been teaching classes that um, – Pratt School of Fine Art, um, which is a, a, a local Seattle um, uh, crafts school. Um, so we had a, sort of a, a pocket of people who were interested, and that filled mm -hmm. up very quick. Um, at, at this point in time, um, our goal is to, um, you know, our cutoff is 15 years old. So right. if you're 15 or above, and, of course, you sign a waiver with your parent or guardian if you're under the age of 18, that the class is available. Um, we have some potential partnerships opening up in the summer of 2018 where we're um, working with a local uh, uh, art and culture nonprofit in Seattle that's pretty well known to incorporate uh, a satellite high school class for 2000, I hope 2018, could be 2019, um, where mm. students can come from a local high school and as an elective class um, study with us. To, um, cause I mean, there is a big initiative in Seattle right now, which is really cool. That's mm -hmm. focusing on kind of giving students avenues in high schools to, um, you know, to, to, to circle back the idea of creativity and to focus on a skill. Um, that's what this initiative is, is, is created for. So we've got some, mm -hmm. some partnerships in the works that are, um, going to be focused on that. And then a couple of, uh, public art projects that are, um, we're beginning to discuss with um, that same nonprofit um, this summer about working with um, what we call young people, you know, people who are between the ages of, of, of you know, 15 and 18 and, and trying to 
work with them in that in that, that formative time of their life to um, you know, give them an avenue to focus their creativity and, and realize that uh, it could potentially be gainful income at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, down the road, we got plans for uh, intermediate classes, um, advanced classes. Uh, we're looking at adding a, a virtual reality um, focus class for the fall um, that will, you know, not only make that connection between the analog possibilities of the medium as well as the um, the future, the next level, um, by incorporating painting with light in a 3D space to how you can actually then put that back into um, a pattern to make something in neon or potentially a student wants to combine a beginning class and, and, and make a piece in, in neon and learn that and then work with that in a virtual space to make something we haven't seen before, great. We're, we're, we're definitely psyched on that too. Yeah, this is really exciting. You're, this is just the beginning and there's so much stuff that's going to be happening down the road and uh, I'm excited to see how that runs. Um, uh, especially, uh, I think you had hinted at something about whatever, whatever timeline down the road, you got uh, resident artists that can come in and kind of explore the medium uh, that that sounds really cool too. Yeah, I think that's the idea. Is that we're we're just in the beginning of this, and um, we, uh, you know, like we talked about in the beginning. I mean, we're passionate, we're driven, we know where we want to go. I don't know if we know exactly how we're going to get there, but uh, we're we're you know we're just we're over overwhelmed and excited at the response to um, not only the the first class was so. Was, was was so powerful that 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 people when we say hey we've we, you know we we started this neon school people are like oh my god that's amazing I'm like wow cool that yeah okay I mean it's it's just cool so people respond to it in um, such a positive way so yeah who knows where it'll go uh, you return you keep returning to the the virtual reality thing is that something you just started messing with yourself I kind of saw a little blurb on Instagram. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, I, in 2015, uh, created a show that, um, it's called Not a Hologram, and we, it was kind of a, um, post apocalyptic show, kind of, uh, touching on personal themes that I'm interested in, you know, the anthropocentric blues, I call it, the, you know, the kind of, um, the, the, the possibly end of the world type, uh, type approach, but what we did was create a show that was, you know, a light-based show, and then I had a, um, these two artists, Grant Kirkpatrick and Fritz Rodriguez, um, Grant handles digital content and visuals and is a storyteller, and Fritz is a uh, custom 360 mix audio engineer and sound artist, and so we just kind of, you know, got together, and um, I don't know how we all met, but we just sort of you know, met up and um, created a virtual reality version of that show that you could then, because um, I'm, I'm always interested in that, you know, that idea of how do you make something portable? How do you make this medium, which is so dependent upon infrastructure and installing tubes and, and elements somewhere, how do you get people to see that who can't be there? So, you know, my dream was to turn the show into a virtual reality piece that then you could just share online. You know, I could email somebody the show and they could then in a virtual space visit the show. So it was kind of like a video game, kind of like a experience. It, you know, it had its own soundtrack and, um, it's, yeah, it was, but it was a cool experiment. And so as I got more into it, I, uh, I, uh, well, as I got more into it, I realized it was a, is a medium that would work for me because people have always asked how I got into this medium because, you know, I'm not a bender. I didn't get into this medium like a bender or a technician or um, apprenticing at a glass shop or something like that or however however anybody gets into the medium. I, I got into a completely different way. So uh, it, it became a tool for me to um, reimagine this this very formative past and to recreate uh, a, a series of memories uh, with this wonderful medium um, virtually. So I work with the same guys and um, really fell in love with that technology and what its capabilities are, but was also realizing that 
when I, when I, when I got into Tilt Brush, which is the Google program that allows you to paint um, or draw in a 3D space, I was just like, oh my God, this is like, just like working in neon or, or light. And um, what if we gave people the ability to have access to that? Because, you know, again, it's like, you don't just go, hey, I'm going to go to my buddy's house and get an Oculus Rift and go painting, you know, mm -hmm. unless you know somebody. Mm -hmm. So to be able to establish that for students and make that connection between um, light as this one medium, but light as this other medium and, and kind of merge the two, that became very important for us. Nice. Yeah. And um, so now, but uh, curiously enough, the uh, working in that medium and um, reimagining that past history, um, I've actually, I've, I've been learning to bend in the last month so that I can um, create one of the pivotal elements for that body of work. And um, which is my mom's name, uh, Judy, writ written in clear glass and pumped with, with uh, neon because that was what hung in my childhood kitchen um, growing up. So I, I sort of grew up in this kitchen in this sort of formative environment uh, with this, my mom's name in neon in a kitchen. So um, to truly reimagine that piece, uh, you know, there's nobody else who should make that piece but me. Mm -hmm. um, however it looks, you know, if it <laughs> ends up looking looking crazy or junky, well, it should because, you know, memory is not always accurate. So, mm -hmm. um, so it's cool. I mean, it's opened up new doors for me. Now I'm doing something that, uh, you know, is a challenge and uh, learning myself, which is great. Uh, would you say that um, that neon sign that, that hung in your in your kitchen uh, was the starting point of this interest in light, which led you to to look at neon? Um, you know what? Y yes and no. I mean, basically, I um, you know, in I'll put it this way. I mean, I'll be I'll be seven years uh, sober on February third, which is also my my real birthday, so it's kind of a double birthday. And, um, you know, from the period of like 2001 to 2011, man, I, I didn't even make any art. I mean, I was, I was, I was literally in a black hole of addiction. So, you know, when I got sober in 2011 and started making work again, I mean, I was voracious. I was driven. And I mean, I still am, but it was kind of like making all these bodies of work and making so much of it over and over and over that, you know, people are like, why do you work in this medium? Or like, what's up with neon or like, are you a bender? And, you know, I always felt in some way kind of weird that I wasn't a bender, but I worked in this medium like compulsively. And so it just kind of took me a while to realize, Oh, wait a minute. I've been making the same thing over and over and over again. in just all these different ways. And I realized it was about that kitchen because in that kitchen, my mom's that, that, that sign was in, you know, there's also this, cause she's, she's been sober now for a long time too, but at that point in time growing up, she was kind of a, a, a Jekyll and Hyde alcoholic. And so at night when she would pass out, um, there's that neon sign. There's that cabinet under the sink that had the light in it where her, you know, her bourbon was. And then there's that black and white TV over on this little hutch by the table where I would see, you know, Blade Runner for the first time on a black and white TV, I would see like Robocop Terminator, like an early cable and watch these, you know, crazy late night movies. It just really dawned on me that unknowingly I've been making this room over and over and over again. So I think that that, 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 that sign just subconsciously was in the DNA of who I am as an artist and it just kept reemerging. So to go back and, reimagine that space and, and to um, kind of force myself to start over and kind of get back into the medium in a different way and learn how to actually bend that sign to like remake that pivotal object um, became very important. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the same kind of passion we can tap into for people who want to come study with us and, you know, talk about that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. It only leads to, New doors opening. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It comes back to that. Um, 
you find something and you continually dig at it until you realize that's what you've been making and that's what you'll be, you will oh, be totally. making. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it, it's just always, I, I think it's just that, you know, like my mom, you know, I've said this before and, and, and I think I posted it in that social media and stuff, but like, you know, my mom always says life is like a spiral, you know, and you're just spinning in time. It's just kind of like you're, kind of going up and down the spiral and you're sort of seeing things from above and below and right in front of it, but it's kind of always the same stuff. It's just where, where, where what point on the spiral you're at at that point in time. Um, I think I used to battle against that or grind against that. Like, no, you can always push forward, always, always do something different. And, and, and of course you can, but I think that as a person, yeah, you kind of always scratching at that thing and, trying to figure out what's, you know, what's in there. Thank you again for setting aside time to join us on the podcast. Um, especially taking time out of your day to, uh, do this interview. Uh, where can we find more information about the school? You can find our school, um, Western neon school of art at WNSA Seattle.org. And, um, all of our information for programs and uh, background at the school and who we are as a team uh, can be found right there. The outro is Reentry by Laps. Laps is a Chicago based artist whose work can only be described as a remedy for time consisting of motion and sound. If you give his music a listen, you'll understand exactly what that means. Check out his music on Facebook, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Bandcamp. Thank you for listening to the Tammy Lightning Podcast. I'd like to thank Danny Cates for connecting me with Dylan Newworth and Western Neon, and Dylan for taking the time to be on the podcast. While we did touch up on his work, I highly recommend going to his website and looking through all his artwork and writings. And I hope to have him on a future podcast to talk about a few things I've been thinking about since our initial recording. Also, I'd like to thank Rick Lassiner for supporting me as a place of research and inspiration, as well as encouraging me to pursue this project. And the Plasma R Alliance, where I have an access to a well of knowledge and connects me to some amazing people. Keep an eye out for more classes at Pittsburgh Glass Center as we work to provide a space for learning neon and plasma. For more information on workshops and summer intensives, Please check us out on the web at www.pittsburghglasscenter.org or call us at the studio at 412-365-2145. If you'd like to support the podcast, simply go to taminglighting.net and click subscribe. Later, there will probably be other options in the future, but for now, like, share, comment, and subscribe. See you next time.